And the big idea behind this series is that when it comes to the new you in the new year, most of the time people just naturally gravitate towards focusing on things on the outside, external things like physical health or career goals or maybe home improvement projects for the new you in the new year. But in many ways, the biggest change you could make this year is doing a better job of navigating things that are going on, not on the outside, but on the inside, in our hearts and in our minds. And so last week, we spent uh, an entire week just kind of unpacking and addressing uh, something that can be good in our minds and our hearts, but if we don't address it in a correct way, if we just let it linger there, it can bring a burden to our lives. What we looked at was what to do with guilt. This week, we're going to unpack another emotion or feeling that many of us uh, struggle with and all of us at one point or another need to battle against. It's, it's this, anger. Now, I'm guessing that some of you listening online or here in the room, you're hearing what the topic is for today and maybe your impression is, you know, I, I don't really struggle with that a whole lot. It doesn't apply to me. I don't think quite as much. You know, uh, I don't really get angry. I don't have anger. I might have a little bit of frustration, but anger, I don't get angry. And just want to ask the question, (laughs) what's the difference? And, And the honest truth is there is no difference for the most part. I think here, I think this might be the one difference. When you and I see anger in someone else, we call it anger. But when you and I look in the mirror and see anger in us, we soft pedal it a little bit and we call it frustration. (laughs) And the truth is that probably more than any other time that I can remember, people are having a very difficult time navigating this emotion. The emotion or the feeling of anger has always been around ever since, well, even ever since the fall into sin, even before that, of course. But when it comes to how people are addressing it in in healthy ways or non-healthy ones, this is a very good topic for us to think about and to talk through. And so what I want to do first is just help you understand why you feel angry. And most people have a very simplistic view of anger. It goes something like this. Anger is bad. And anger can be bad. Anger can be bad if it just sits in our hearts unaddressed, And out of it can come a life filled with bitterness and hatred and and outrage. Joy gets stripped away when anger is allowed to just sit in our hearts. Um, Anger can be bad for the people around us. If, If you're a person who is chronically angry, or if you want frustrated, if you're chronically angry, a lot of times people don't enjoy being around you. They're walking on pins and needles because they aren't sure what's the next thing that's going to come up that's going to cause an outburst. So anger can be bad, but what I I want you to know is, is that anger is not always bad. One of the reasons why I know that is that God gets angry. In fact, Over 300 times in the Bible, it references God being angry. That when Jesus lived here on this earth, he got angry. If you're following along in your notes, here's our first fill-in for today. At the heart of it, here's what anger is. Anger is a sign simply that you care about something. If you feel angry... It's going to be connected to something that you care about. Let let me show you what I mean. Um, Any of you ever been to a youth sporting event? Okay. 
Um, any of you been to a youth sporting event and seen any angry parents? <laughs> I can't think of too many youth sporting events where I haven't seen angry parents. Who do they, who do they mostly get mad at? I, sometimes the coach, but I think it's primarily the referees because they are so bad. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Unfortunately, this has been such a chronic problem that some of you know this, that most states have a referee shortage. And a big part of it is that people don't want to spend an hour just getting yelled at by coaches and by parents. Why do parents get so angry at youth sporting events? It's because they're trying to relive their athletic uh, careers through their children. <laughs> Might be part of it. A big part of why they get angry is that there is someone on the court or the field that they love and they care about and they want to see do well. And so they're emotionally attached to a fourth grade basketball game. <laughs> Just think about that for a moment. <laughs> now, take those parents and have them attend a game where they know nobody, no kids, no ref, no coach, it's just a game. More than likely, in most cases, they're not going to get as angry because they don't care as much. And, and maybe this analogy can help you understand a little bit about why Jesus got angry. One of the, one of the times that you probably remember the most when Jesus got angry was when he went to the temple and they were making, the money changers were making God's house into basically a marketplace and they were cheating people on top of it. And so Jesus got angry and he flipped over tables and he, he verbally yelled. And here's why. Because Jesus cared about his heavenly father and the respect and the honor that was due to his heavenly father. And that was a good thing. That was righteous anger. Or in Mark chapter 3, it's written about how Jesus healed a man who had a disabled hand. And the Pharisees are all bent out of shape because they were more concerned about technicalities of Sabbath law rather than just being nice to people and loving them. And Jesus got angry with the Pharisees. And Jesus got angry with the Pharisees often because he cares about people and they cared more about themselves and laws. In this case, Jesus cared about the man with the disabled hand. John Chrysostom, a early church father, he wrote this. He that is angry without cause sins. And he that is not angry when there is cause sins as well. Anger can be bad, but anger is not always bad. And honestly, I think we often get the relationship between anger and love a little bit mixed up. I think sometimes we might think that anger is almost like an opposite of love. It's not. Um, probably a better opposite of love would be like apathy, not caring at all. The opposite of love is apathy, and there's not a lot of anger in apathy. You don't have any feelings at all with apathy. But anger is something that shows that you care. If you truly love someone or you truly love something, there's probably going to be a time where you get angry. If that person is hurt or harmed, you're going to get angry at the person who did it. If um, a person you love disappoints you, you're going to get angry. If a relationship is compromised, there's going to be anger there as part of the emotion. If something that you've hoped for is taken away, there's going to be anger because what we said in number one, anger is a sign that you care about something. Does that make sense? 
I think it's so important to understand where anger comes from because sometimes we're angry and we don't even know why. So what do we do about with that? What do we do about that anger? Well, one of the things that the Bible is really clear about is that the longer you let anger sit in the heart or the mind, what could be a good indicator of some injustice going on and their, the, the need for righteous anger, the longer that sits unaddressed, the more problems it will cause. It's like if a three-year-old accidentally or somehow picked up a knife, the longer they have that knife in their hand, the more likely it is that someone's going to get hurt. Here's what Paul writes. You've probably heard these verses before. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes, Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Get rid of it quickly. If you're feeling anger, we need, we need to stop and ask ourselves why, and we need to do something about it. And then he says, interesting, don't give the devil a foothold. What Jesus is saying, again, is if we let anger sit, it's like the devil has a foothold, and he's going to use that emotion so that we lash out at people or that we grow in our bitterness or that we hurt the people around us, either with our words or even with our actions. And so one of the things that's so important about this anger that is often connected to love is that the anger in our hearts should be addressed quickly. Don't let anger sit. And the thing that I want to dig down on a little bit more today, though, is it's really important to understand why in this moment or in that moment are you feeling anger? Our second fill-in for today says this, it's important to understand the reason for your anger. When it comes to anger, there's something that actually pops up over and over again in our hearts and in our minds, and it's, it's not a good thing. There's a little uh, perspective that we need to think about because, well, what was true for a man named James might be true for you as well. We're going to turn to a letter that this first century pastor named James wrote. Uh, he happened to be one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. He also happened to be uh, Jesus' half-brother. His parents were Mary and Joseph. And he wrote a letter to Christians across the Roman Empire. And one of the things he absolutely must have been hearing is that in many of these churches that there was anger becoming a problem because there was fights and there was quarrels going on. And so James takes some time to address that. And we're going to look at two of those verses. Here's what he writes. What causes fights and quarrels among you? How would you answer that question in your own life? What's causing fights and quarrels in your life? It's the bad ref that's causing it. Or it's the kids and they're not getting their chores done when they're supposed to. They're spending too much time on screens. What causes fights and quarrels among you? It's my mom or it's my dad or it's my spouse or it's the boss or it's the teacher or it's the coach. What causes fights and quarrels among you? It's, it's the Republicans. It's the Democrats. It's, it's the school boards. It's interesting, when it comes to fights and quarrels, our initial reaction to a question like this, and true of the people James was writing to, is we tend to point the finger everywhere else, that everyone else is the problem for the anger and the fights and the quarrels that are going on among us. But then James writes something that I think oftentimes was not only true for the Christians he was writing to, but oftentimes is true for us as well. <laughs> Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? See, you desire something. You want something. 
you want things a certain way. You want life to look a certain way. You desire, but you don't have, so you kill. And James isn't meaning literally that all the Christians were, were killing each other or killing the people they didn't like. What he's saying is you damage things. You're not getting your way, so you damage a relationship. You're not getting your way, so you kill a friendship. <laughs> You're not getting your way, so you don't talk with someone for a really long time. You're not getting your way, and so you kill your happiness and your peace of mind. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and you fight. Anger is a sign that you're not getting something that you want, that you care about something. But, but many, many times, the thing we want isn't always necessarily the things of God. And even if it is, at the end of the day, what James is pointing us to is that a lot of times the biggest reason why anger sits is this. I'm not getting what I want. I have plans. I have an agenda. I have an idea of how that person should treat me or the respect that I'm due. It's my wants and my happiness and my way. And in the midst of anger, and especially, especially anger that just sits in our hearts and in our minds and that we just allow to sit there or that in some ways we can't get rid of, the reason why it sits there so often is because it's become all about me and how I think things should go. So number three, something to be aware of, that self-focused love, like love of self, will lead to self-focused anger. And when we make things all about ourselves, well, anger becomes even more of a problem, and it is going to sit in our hearts longer until we come to a recognition of where we really are at. And so when we take time to think about it, one of the things we might realize is I get really angry about things that I shouldn't. And again, sometimes it starts off as a righteous anger. Is it okay to be angry if someone harmed us or hurt us or hurt our feelings or we got overlooked at work? Absolutely. Anger can be bad. Anger is not always bad. But when we take anger in a moment and allow anger to become a lifestyle, whose fault is that? I get really angry about things that I shouldn't. And the other thing is sometimes they're trivial things that just set us off like coats on the floor or people not saying the words we were hoping to hear and, you know, the list goes on. Another thing to think about with self-focused love is that I don't get angry enough about the things that I should. Where there's maybe a big injustice going on or people mistreating each other. And yeah, it bothers me for a moment, but I get more angry about the coats on the floor or that I lost my car keys than I do about maybe some other big travesty, a difficulty going on in someone else's life. How do we break free from this? What encouragement did James have as he points out that doesn't quarrels and fights, don't they often happen because of things going inside of us and that we're not getting what we want? Here's what he says. It's one sentence. You do not have because you do not ask God. Oh, so all I have to do 
is pray for the referee and he'll make all the calls in the direction that I want. (laughs) All I need, what James is saying is all you need to do is pray and you're going to get whatever it is you're asking for. You know as well as I do that that's not true. So what is James saying? You do not have because you do not ask God. What he's saying is that we need to take the focus in the midst of our anger off of ourselves and off of our wants and our desires in this situation, and we need to come to the Lord in prayer. And when we do, here's what happens. It takes the focus off of ourselves and our wants and our desires and how we think it should go and the hurt that we're feeling and how I need to fix this problem or receive a certain amount of apology for something. When we take it to the Lord in prayer, what's happening is it takes the focus off of us and allows us to consider what is God's will in all of this. And so when you do that, when you pray about the anger that you're feeling, when you bring it to the Lord in prayer, one of the things that happens is you really begin to hone in on what's really going on in our hearts. And sometimes in that process, you know what we come to recognize? That I've been wrong. That I've been selfish. That I've been holding on too long to something that should have long been forgiven. That the problem is in me, and the result of that is I need to confess that. That's not everyone else's fault that I'm frustrated or angry, that, that it's something living inside of me. It's my attitude, and I need to to turn to the Lord, even if it's in just part of the slice of that pie, and to confess and to repent, and then realign your heart with God's truth and God's direction. And other times you bring that thing to the Lord that you're feeling angry about, you come to him in prayer, and what you might come to recognize, no, I have, I have godly motives here. This is as much as I can tell, a righteous anger. Well, even then, so much of what we feel angry about, how much control do you have over it? How much can you control what that person does or what that political party does? So much of it is out of our control. And so we can just decide I'm just going to be angry as long as this continues. Or we can give our concerns to God and trust that he has perfect plans even in the midst of the most imperfect circumstances. One of the passages I think of in this regard is in Romans where where Paul writes, whose is it to avenge? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Basically what he's saying is, your job is not make sure that everything balances out in your life. That's my job. I got this. You know what you need to do? Forgive. You know what you need to do? Trust. You know what you need to do? Break away from anger. Because if you allow it to sit, you're giving the devil a foothold. So as we apply this, I think one of the things that happens is that because anger is an emotion, we often respond emotionally in anger. And believe me, some of you, some of us are more prone to that than others especially outward signs of anger and emotion. Here's my encouragement. When you're feeling the temperature rise, when you feel like you're going to have an angry outburst, or when you've been sitting with internal anger or frustration for a while, respond to anger thoughtfully, not emotionally. And and so the, the first thing in that regard is this. When you feel anger rise up, just stop. 
Stop in that moment. Don't say what you wanted to say to your spouse. Believe me, um, I've lived through this. It goes nowhere good, all right? I've regretted things that I've said, and maybe you have as well. Just stop. Don't send that email. In fact, here's an invitation. I hope I don't get too many. If, if you have an email you need to send to your boss, just send it to me. I'll read it. I'll affirm you. Yeah, you're right. But it won't be the damage that's received when you actually send it to your boss. Don't send that text. Don't post that thing online in the midst of anger. Just stop. Thoughtfully stop and then ask yourself this question. This is a, a very, I hope, helpful sort of tool as, as you feel anger. Ask yourself the question, why am I angry? Should I be angry right now? Is there an abuse or a neglect going on and God would be angry too? Or am I angry right now because I'm not getting what I want and there's a little bit of selfishness in there where I'm not trusting the Lord like I could or like I should. And, and maybe it was anger that was warranted, but Lord, how am I gonna get through this quickly and not let it sit? And then number two, how can I respond in this moment with selfless love? Where can I help this situation get better rather than just doing in anger? Where can I make a difference in what ways do I need to chill out? Where do I need to forgive? Even as maybe I look for an apology from someone else. As so many things in the Bible, this is easy to talk about and it, it can be very hard to do. But as we close today, I want you to recognize something that is um, so amazing. That your greatest hope in life, the reason for your joy, the reason why you can be at peace is because of how God reacted and navigated his righteous anger and what he did with it. One of my favorite passages is this, Romans 5. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, and let me ask, does God get angry over sin? Absolutely, 100%. While we were still sinners, though, Christ died for us. See, God navigates anger always, Perfectly, And when we as people, when we as a world, when you individually sin against God, instead of him taking out his vengeance that was, well, would have been rightly due us for disobeying our holy God, instead, you know what he reacted with is grace, undeserved love shown in so many ways, but primarily in the sending of his son that God actually took out his righteous anger for sin on Jesus so that instead he could offer you and offer me something that we do not deserve. Heaven and joy and peace. And also as a byproduct of what he's given to us, he's given us the opportunity to live new, to not have to live in anger and frustration. As I said at the beginning, this world has a very hard time responding right now to anger in healthy ways, and it can take people in some pretty scary places. Unaddressed anger is going to cause problems. But if we, by God's help, address it quickly, if we ask ourselves the question, what's really going on here right now? Why am I angry? And then by God's grace, ask for forgiveness when we mess up. Well, we have the ability to live in a new way with peace that maybe you haven't experienced for a very long time and with an opportunity to have a newness of life 
that God wants for you and he's given to you as we break away from anger. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us, that although we deserve your righteous anger, that the hope and the joy and the blessing of the gospel is that you took that righteous anger out on someone else, on your son, and that through his payment for sin in our place, that we're able to live in peace and in joy. Lord, my prayer is that we are able to now reflect just a a little bit of of that grace. We're we're not going to do it perfectly, but a little bit of that grace to those who make us angry and that we might forgive like you forgive, that we might have patience like you've had patience for us and that we might live in the, the joy and peace that happens when we address anger quickly and not live in it. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.